So STAMPEDE stands for Systemic Therapy in Advanced or Metastatic Prostate Cancer Evaluation of Drug Efficacy. Um, and we started with a, this group of uh, notables, uh, Nick James, Malcolm Mason, myself, David Durnley, and two statisticians, Matt Sides and Max Palmer, um, six men in a room. And Max really had the idea for the multi-arm, multi-stage design. That was in about 2002. We planned it all, got going actually in 2005. So the first thing we've learned, I think, over years is the utility of the multi-arm, multi-stage trial design. Now, as you can see from the background of this slide, it's quite old. This was our concept study. There were new drugs coming along, and we felt that we should test them all at the same time. Um, it was a question of what we could get from pharma uh, and what was available, whether there was a cancer signal. We originally called it the spider trial because it had so many legs. Um, but we elected on this, which is a standard of care versus new treatments alone or in combinations, oledronic acid, dostaxel, celecoxib, and a combination of the two. And we had signals from clinical trials or good uh, uh, lab data. Now to the concept of the MAMS design, and this is a, a really critical thing. Um, if you take a traditional approach to a phase one therapy, therapy one, therapy two, therapy three, and so on, it goes through this phase two approach, and then it may fail at this point. And once you've got past the phase two st a bit of it, you ha then have to run a phase three trial, and this takes at least 15 years for the majority of uh, decent sized studies. The principle here was that if you have a control arm, you can run the control arm continuously and set all the therapies off at the same time and evaluate them at specific stages, stage one, two, three, and so on. And that's determined by certain factors. So here we are. This was the outset of the first MAMS trial, that stampede, never been done before. Um, we have a pilot stage, because everybody said, oh, it's too complicated, people won't randomize. And we, we didn't have data on the combinations either. So we had to run a pilot of about 260 patients to see whether it was feasible. Then we jump over that hurdle, and then we're on to activity stage one to three. And the arrow gets bigger, and that arrow is the hazard ratio. So the hazard ratio is set low. In other words, the, f the fence is low, so you can get over it. And, and the fence gets higher and higher the further into the trial. And you, we're measuring, ultimately, overall survival as the end point. But one of the key things is that as the trial goes, you can drop out inefficient drugs or drug combinations or individuals which are too toxic, and you can put the next drug in if the control arm stays the same. So this is how it works. We start off in 2005 here, and that's our study plan. We've got the end of the pilot phase, April 2007. We've got 500 patients by 2008, 2010. Um, we're on to activity stage two. And this is where we look at the hazard ratio for the combination of ADT celecoxib and zoledronic acid celecoxib, and it failed. So we take that out. We published it. In fact, we probably took it out for the wrong reasons because we took it out on PSA failure. And actually, the combination of zoledronic acid and celecoxib metastatic is actually quite effective. But then in comes the next drug combination, ADT and abiraterone, and it runs against the control because the control hasn't changed because we haven't got sufficient follow-up here to analyze this trial, which is planned on the number of events. So here we are at the end of the abiraterone pilot phase. It starts to be repeated, and then in comes the next one, M1RT here, planned to run with a shorter duration because the event rate's high, and then early 2014, we start ADT uh, against ENSA and abiraterone. Now, this is what it looks like now with a number of trials completed in follow-up, and new ones coming on the block. The advantage is here, if you're adding arms, this is the time in months to the first new patient since comparison added and sites randomizing. So when we started in 2005, it took us about this length of time to get to 120 sites. But the infrastructure was then set up because the next arm that comes in takes about three months to get to 80% recruitment. This is the next arm, Abiraterone uh, M1RT, and this is the ends of Abbey. So it really foreshortens everything that you do and avoids all that complication of getting a trial going. And of course, you have to manage a large-scale trial like this and future-proof it. And we have a trial management group. I'll show you the, the list of names in a minute. That's got bigger and bigger. Nick James has been the principal investigator for these, but then we add in 
um, Chris Parker, Gert Hattard, Silke Gillison, um, Simon Chowdhury, and so on, so that each time we're not only uh, managing the trial, we're encouraging younger people to come on, and we're almost future-proofing it, because by this time, certain people have dropped out. Malcolm Mason's retired, David Durnley is about to retire. So this trial's going to go for another 10 years, and will obviously uh, um, run longer um, than I will. So the next phase, and I'll talk about this towards the end, is the treatment of oligometastatic disease. So that's the kind of group that you need to run the trial. Uh, in the UK and Switzerland, a combination of TMG, principal investigators. There are now 40 statisticians working on this at the MRC. And you need an independent data monitoring committee. They never get a mention. Uh, and the trial steering committee and lots of subcommittees. So it's a big infrastructure and that requires investment and planning. But if you get that right, you can reset all kinds of things, like the baseline. For example, here is the M1 control arm, 900 patients, we published in 2015. Modern medicine, how we're doing with prostate cancer, not that well. Half of the patients failing in 12 months, and this number dying in five years. So with the best available care. And if we then look at M0, we didn't realize how long the M0 patients would survive with treatment, much better than we thought. So these are the deaths, about one in five out at the five-year point, but about half of them failing uh, at that point. But within that, we could also find out some subgroup um, hypothesis generating information. So if we look at this, for example, um, this is the prognosis of newly diagnosed M0 uh, patients. We have about 5,500. And when we start to boil those down, we have a group who were uh, non-metastatic. And partway through the trial, with the publication of uh, trial data, we mandated radiotherapy. And what that enabled us to do is to look at the effect of primary radiotherapy in node-positive and node-negative patients. So these are node-negative in the pelvis who've got radiotherapy. They seem to do better than those who don't have radiotherapy. And interestingly, when we look at patients who are pelvic node positive, and previously these patients would not have been irradiated in many centres, they too seem to do rather better when they're irradiated than when they're not irradiated. So there's a fair amount of hypothesis generation that comes out uh, of, uh, of a, a study like this. Of course, the big ticket items, um, the utility of dose tax and aberratura, which we've got so far, we had the publication of Jetug 15. You know the detail of this trial. It was too small, really, to yield any conclusions. Charted, had a definitive conclusion, but put in a volume characteristic, something which I'll talk about in a minute. And Stampede came on uh, as a much larger study, um, really, with the power um, and the events. And this is the, the uh, trial is, is analyzed on the basis of events in the control arm. Um, to show conclusively that in metastatic disease, there's a major survival advantage. And of course, uh, uh, we can put this data together. So as Stampy was, ma was maturing, we've been in touch with the Jetug team, we've been in touch with the Chartered team. We put all the data together through the MRC uh, meta-analysis team uh, in London. And this is what you get from Dose Taxel. Very clear data, practice changing on an international scale. And similarly with aberatron, because this also was a maturing, there were M1 patients largely in latitude, well, exclusively in latitude, with a risk cate categorization. Stampede was M0 and M1 with no risk categorization and a clear benefit. Now, the interesting thing here, latitude was planned on the 36-month interim analysis. Stampede, as I said, based on the event rate in the control arm. So longer follow-up, but the hazard ratio is strikingly similar and the survival and progression-free survival curves look very similar. And again, practice changing data at a high level. That was meta-analyzed. I'm not showing you a slide of that. In the middle of all this, again, more hypothesis generation, um, because we had a, a combined period where we were recruiting both to Dostaxel and Aberatron with the same standard of care. We had about 500-odd patients here. Um, with very similar characteristics, recruited at the same time under the same conditions, not head-to-head. -head. But what that shows is this, that if you look at the summary data here on this uh, plot, there's a lot more detail to this. When we look at aberatron uh, as a primary, it's much better at, at suppressing the PSA. So progression-free survival, which is largely a function of PSA, 
looks better. But when we look at other, the other key uh, um, uh, metrics, metastatic, symptomatic, skeletal, course specific and overall survival, the two treatments are pretty much identical. So when we're in a quandary as to what to give, we can advise as to roughly what the effect is going to be. But it's probably like, uh, uh, fair to say that many clinicians change treatment on the basis of a PSA and patients certainly don't like a rising PSA. So that might influence the next step in treatment if choosing um, dostaxel over abiraterone. We've developed a number of parallel translational research programs, and I think this is a really critical component uh, which will start to yield a lot of fruit and is already doing so, actually. We have the biomedical research group, the biomedical imaging group, health economic analysis, and a newly de uh, developed artificial intelligence group to try to put together this body of molecular and imaging information, etc., with the outcomes. And so the BRG Molecular Resource, this is being run by Gert Attard uh, as the head of the management group, it's a big group, is bringing in all of the tissue relating to this part of the trial. We've got about 2,500 tumour blocks coming in, saliva, um, sequential uh, measurements of uh, serum and so on. So this is how it works. Um, we've got... Um, requests for the blocks. They come into two cancer banks, one at, uh, in Cardiff through Malcolm Mason, one at the Christie through me. And the blocks are then transferred to Bart's uh, where Dan Burney, the lead pathologist, is coordinating it. So we take the sections for morphological assessment, um, sections for uh, whole generation sequencing, sections for RNA extraction and so on. And we can marry those to clinical outcome on a large scale. And that e equally is allied to plasma collection from a number of centres up and down the British Isles. And this is the kind of thing that we got as of October 2018. This is ongoing at the moment. These figures are constantly being updated. So baseline samples, sequential samples, failure samples, and so on. And we've just got uh, an application for funding in for other aspects, this, and we've just submitted for the metformin to look at the meta metabolomics, where we'll look at things like um, energy regulation as a, as a regulator of uh, genomic instability. We've got a second um, element of this combining with image to look at sarcopenia with combination novel androgen imaging uh, and so on. So there's a lot to come out of this. The biomedical imaging group also is running parallel. Now we're pulling in all the scans to the Christie in Manchester. Uh, we have about 5,000 so far um, and we're, our aim is for over 10,000. You can see where they're coming from and um, they are pulled in through a central data storage system. Um, so they're uh, anonymized and there's this process we have to go through. It took us about two and a half years to get this cracked, a lot of bureaucracy. But ultimately, we've got image analysis on all of these patients and we're currently um, feeding data out from this. So we have data on location of METs, number of METs, volume of METs, linked to overall survival, failure free, skeletal events, and so on and so forth. So what do we get from this? Well, we're able to interrogate big questions, such as what do we mean by high volume and high risk? Because these have been pulled out of the air largely. We have a charted risk volume, low and high, based on bone metastases number. It doesn't actually quantify the, the, the uh, METs at all. And then we have latitude, which introduces Gleason grade and visceral metastases. Now, if we apply charted and um, latitude criteria to our data in Stampede, you can see how we can do it. So here are the dose taxal analysis. Um, we have 1,200 patients. It boils down to different arms. We uh, uh, can stratify. We've got arm A, arm C, arm E, and so on for a charted analysis. We then put in the Gleason score, and we can look at a latitude analysis. And what we can see is that if we take all our, our stampede patients here and we apply charted criteria, we can see that between 35 and 40% of patients using charted criteria wouldn't have been treated in the stampede trial. And if we use latitude criteria, it's nearly 45% who will miss out on treatment. So what does that mean? Well, we presented this, we're about to publish this. Uh, it's just about to go in either to the Lancet or European Urology. We'll decide in the next week. And this is on abiraterum, stratified for high and low volume. So you can see how we've done it, inclusion criteria, just short of 1,000 patients, roughly 500 in each. We exclude the missing Gleason's and so on. So we have 450 in each. 
And you can see then, again, that if we apply latitude criteria, we're missing out a whole load of patients. And tra charted low and high, we're missing out a whole load of patients. And charted doesn't match latitude. There's about an 18% difference. What does that mean in data terms? Well, what you can see is this, that if you look at this forest of overall survival, failure free, skeletal events, progression free, and prostate cancer specific death using latitude criteria, whether you're low risk or high risk, you get benefit. And there is no statistical interaction. What that means is, if you give the treatment, you get the effect. There's no difference. If we apply charted criteria, I'll show you in a minute, we've got prostate cancer specific survival here, low risk, high risk, skeletal related events, low risk, high risk, metastasis progression free survival, and so on. So if you think about that and think about the crossover of uh, charted low risk who wouldn't be treated with abiratro, and that's about 45% of patients who would miss out on this kind of benefit from treatment. So we think the license indication needs to change, and that's come out directly from looking at images in a structured, stratified way in large volume. And by the way, if you put charted criteria on the same data set, it has the same effect. You give the drug, you get the benefit. So onto this, and there's quite a Twitter storm about this at the minute. Um, this is prostate radiotherapy and the, the use of uh, radiotherapy in metastatic disease. This is uh, uh, arm K uh, here. Sorry, arm, G arm H here. I'm getting mixed up. Um, we published this in October 2018. And it was a large-scale study, just under 2,200 patients. And the background to this was men with metastatic prostate cancer receiving systemic treatment. We hypothesized that treatment to the primary site would be beneficial, and we stratified that for radiotherapy dosage and for primary tumor volume. So two pre-planned meta-analyses. That was the structure of the study. I think you're probably familiar with that. And this was our metastatic burden pre-specified subgroup. And this is what there's been a lot of controversy about and a lot of falsehoods uh, written in the electronic media. So we, we stratified according to charted criteria, bone scan data. Very important to remember that. And we pre-planned that. And this was the result. So if we took the trial overall. This is the overall survival with high metastatic burden. There's absolutely no value in irradiating the primary. Um, either in terms of overall survival or failure-free survival. However, if you take the patients with low volume disease, in other words, four metastases or fewer on bone scan, that's all you need to do, then there's a clear benefit in terms of survival and failure-free survival. And the difference here, when you look at the interaction, the figures are quite different, telling you that this population is different from this population on a large scale with a pre-planned analysis. So whatever you read on Twitter, you can disregard it because there's a clear evidence that the effect size does differ by disease burden. If you treat the primary uh, prostate with radiotherapy in men who've got four or fewer metastases on bone scan, there's a higher chance of benefit than not getting benefit. Now, this is, uh, comes back to really what Axel was saying in, in his studies, um, very well done, but somewhat underpowered. So this is Horad, uh, which again, I'm sure you'll have seen. And this took a long time to recruit, about 10 years, and was under 500 patients. So what was interesting in the sub-analysis was that when looking at patients who had fewer than five metastases, there's a hazard ratio of 0.68. So there's a trend towards improvement. But the trial is simply not big enough to answer the question. By contrast, Stampede, much bigger, has an identical hazard ratio. But because it's big enough, it shows the effect. So the principle is here, really, that in, a tri in cancer trials, whether it's prostate or renal or whatever, you have to get the population size up so it's big enough so you get statistical power to show the differences in subgroups. And I'd like to bet in the renal cancer trials, if we get them up to this size, then we will probably see there are different populations. Now, just a brief word about this. Imaging in the PSMA PET era, because we know that there's huge confusion over what to do about PSMA. It's running ahead of the, of, of the clinic, and nobody really understands what the meaning of low-risk, low-volume, 
PSMA detected nodes is. Um, but what we can say is this, that on the basis of the image analysis pre-planned in Stampede, the bone scan is predictive, not prognostic. It's predictive of response. Now, I don't understand why. There's something biological going on in relation to the bone scan number. So you can see here where there's been an, al an analysis of the hazard ratio in Stampede for bone scans, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. What you can see is that as you get to ma the magic number of four, and we haven't published this yet, but volume doesn't make any difference, it's simply number, and we have quantified these, then it all starts to go pear-shaped. And so when you get to five, there's really no benefit. So something is overwhelming the system at that point. And we don't quite understand what it is. But what this has helped us to do is to redefine the criteria for inclusion in oligometastatic trials. Uh, again, there's huge confusion over what oligometastatic means. Is that based on the number of METs? Is it nodal? Is it bone? It, what does liver metastases mean? Nobody can really give us a clear answer because nobody knows. But we have learned from this analysis that the bone scan's predictive. So we can use that as a tool for dichotomizing the next stage of stampede. Now, again, this is what I mean. From, this is from the uh, BIG analysis. This was done by two of our research fellows uh, working in Manchester, looking at the median number. And you can see how the three-year failure-free survival and the overall survival start to come together as the bone scan uh, number goes up. So in Stampede, with the new arms coming, we have, um, so far, we're going to report on Enza Abbey probably this year. Metformin has recruited about 1,400 patients, and we've, uh, we've grafted on an estrogen-based study which has got about 1,600 patients in, all of which will have imaging data, and all of which ultimately will have tissue, serum, and so on. And then we've got oligometastatic disease and polymetastatic disease. So we will dichotomize into these two groups. We've got a funding application in currently with CRUK for this part of the trial, which is eligible for Stampede, baseline imaging, and we've mandated CT and bone scan. If anybody wants to do a PSMA scan, that's fine. We'll analyze the data based on how it looks and what the response is in relation to the standard imaging. So that might give us information on PSMA and other scanning. And then we decide on the standard of care, consent for randomization into arm A, which is ADT, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy to the prostate, or standard of care, radiotherapy to the prostate, and SABER radiotherapy for up to five metastatic sites. And the reason for five as opposed to four is to see if we can push the envelope a little further um, by irradiating the metastases. One thing that we've added in here, and there's been quite a debate in the uh, uh, UK uh, research community and amongst the Stampede group, is about surgery. Because surgery has been and is increasingly being used in high risk. About one in five patients in the UK uh, with locally advanced prostate cancer are treated with radical prostatectomy. And we felt that there would be an extrapolation by the clinical community to start operating on metastatic patients as well, based on our information. So we put alongside an option for the use of radical prostatectomy in this metastatic group. And we hope to get about seven or 800 patients so we can at least try to compare the um, validity, efficacy of surgery alongside radiotherapy in this setting. So what have we learned from Stampede so far? What will we learn in the future? Well, I think probably the take-home message is think about the multi-arm, multi-stage approach to your trials when you're planning them. Think about collaboration and a big organization, and that can be within one country. It can be with, across boundaries. And in that way, you can get the data size up and think about co-aligning data with other trial groups to match where you can to do meta-analyses to answer big questions which then change practice. I've got a final thanks for everybody who's worked hard here and that goes particularly for the MRC team and although I've shown three names here, there are actually 40 people working in the MRC on this trial at the moment, um, doing all kinds of work behind the scenes. And of course, the patients and centres who are recruiting up and down the UK and in Switzerland. Thanks very much.